Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the thermal boundary layer. Now, the thermal boundary layer is the same thing as what you're used to for the momentum boundary layer, the normal boundary layer from fluids. The difference is we are seeing how temperature changes for flow over a flat plate instead of the momentum. So the momentum boundary layer looks something like the square root for a flat plate. Now, what the momentum boundary layer is showing you is how far away from the wall you need to be in order for the local velocity to equal the undisturbed velocity. So the thermal boundary layer does very much the same thing, but its shape is going to be a little bit different. And that shape is dependent on something called the Prandtl number. So the Prandtl number is non-dimensional, and it's another ratio. This time, it's a ratio of diffusivities. On the top, we have the diffusivity of momentum. And on the bottom, we have the diffusivity of heat. So if you remember, the diffusivity of momentum is the kinematic viscosity, whereas the diffusivity of heat we write as alpha. So the Prandtl number can be written most simply as just nu over alpha. However, we can simplify that a little bit. Nu, we know, is mu, the dynamic viscosity, divided by the density rho. Alpha, we know from previous videos, is just our thermal conductivity divided by rho times Cp, where Cp is the specific heat. So we can rearrange this and get that the Prandtl number can also be written as mu times Cp over k. So the Prandtl number it won't affect the shape of the boundary layer, but it will affect how it scales. So if our Prandtl number is 1, then the diffusivity of momentum and heat are the same, and we actually end up with the exact same shape and size here. So now what happens if we increase our Prandtl number? Well, if we're increasing our Prandtl number, that means that we are increasing the diffusivity of momentum compared to that of heat. Well, the momentum is going to stay the same, so the heat needs to change. We're decreasing the Prandtl, <clears throat> we're increasing the Prandtl number, which means the diffusivity of heat is going to lower. Well, as air flows over our plate here, the heat will seep out, the heat will diffuse slower than our momentum, which means that as we go along, the thermal boundary layer will be smaller if the Prandtl number is larger. Now, if the Prandtl number is smaller, the exact opposite will happen. Heat will leak out faster from the wall, meaning that it will affect more of the flow further away from the wall. When the Prandtl number is smaller, the thermal boundary layer will be larger. So all three of these red lines are different thermal boundary layers. All right, it sometimes helps to see boundary layers in a slightly different light. The way we've drawn it, this is our x location, this is our y location. And what we've plotted is that point where either the temperature becomes that of the surroundings or where the velocity becomes the same as the surrounding flow. So what we're going to do instead is take a cross section here, a single value of x. And now we're going to look at how the velocity changes and the temperature changes in the y direction. For a standard momentum boundary layer, we expect the velocity to increase linearly at first and then curve into whatever our max velocity is. So this value right here would be 1, right? This would be the point where our local velocity, the lowercase u, is equal to the outside velocity, this uppercase u. So for temperature, again, if our Prandtl number is equal to 1, then we're just going to line right on top of that. If our Prandtl number is greater than 1, again, that means that heat hasn't had a chance to diffuse into the rest of the flow. And so we're going to stay stuck at the outside velocity for longer before we curve in towards the plate temperature. We're going to be stuck at the outside temperature for longer before we get stuck in the plate temperature. So this was for Prandtl number greater than 1. And then for Prandtl number less than 1, well, we're going to diffuse really far into the flow 
And so it's going to take a really long time before we're able to get to the outside temperature. Now, this x-axis now is not our u over u. Instead, for our thermal boundary layers, our x-axis is the local temperature, T, minus the temperature of the wall. So that there's a temperature difference, which is why it goes to zero at the wall, divided by T infinity, the surrounding temperature, minus the temperature of the wall. So we still go to one at the end here, right? As we get to one, that means that our temperature is equal to T infinity. So that's a picture of the thermal boundary layer, what it looks like, and what the temperature profile and momentum profile actually look like on that boundary layer. But what we're really interested in is the heat flux and the heat flow on this flat plate. So the way we get there is something called the Nusselt number. And we use NU for the Nusselt number. And the Nusselt number is simply a ratio of the convective heat transfer and the conductive heat transfer. The convective heat transfer, we can just write as HA times delta T. And the conductive heat transfer, we can write as K over L times A delta T. Well, most of this just cancels out, and we end up with HL over K. So normally when we see the Nusselt number written, all you really see is this HL over K. Let's talk about the actual heat flux from the thermal boundary layer. And then from there, we can look into what the Nusselt number would be for a flat plate. So our heat flux, our lowercase q, is going to be equal to K times delta T times 0 0.332 times the Prandtl number times the Reynolds number based off of x, since we're using x as our variable here, to so the 1 half, multiplied by 1 over x. So this 0 0.332 term should look a little bit familiar. It's half of the 0.664 that you get from the momentum boundary layer whenever you're going to solve for friction drag. It's a bit involved to get into here, but you can use the same sort of ordinary differential equation in order to solve and find this 0 0.332 term. Okay, so we have all of this together. What we're interested in here is what our convection heat transfer coefficient is. And really that's everything but this delta T. So everything else is our H. Then going back to our Nusselt number, this Nusselt number is going to be based off of the X in our equation. And it's equal to H, and this L is going to be the length variable that we define here. So this is going to be HX over K. So looking at our two equations here, we have an X in the numerator and then one in the denominator. So those are going to end up canceling out. And then this K and this K are also going to end up canceling out. So what we end up with is a relatively simple term of 0.332 times the Prandtl number to the one third times the Reynolds number to the one half. So this Nusselt number tells us something about the heat transfer at a specific point in X. It's not over the entire flat plate, it's over a specific point. So the total Q, the Q that we have over the entire flat plate is going to be just the integral over the entire length of that Q. And this Q is per meter squared the length takes care of one of those meters, we also need to multiply by the width of the flat plate. And we're integrating in the dx direction. So this integral isn't too bad. We have a variable x in the Reynolds number, and we have a variable x right here in the denominator. So the Reynolds number, just for completeness sake, is rho times our velocity u multiplied by x divided by the dynamic viscosity mu. So the only variable in this integration is this square root of x divided by x, or just 1 over the square root of x. Everything else is constant. And what we end up with from that is that w multiplied by k delta t multiplied by 0 0.664 times the Prandtl number to the 1 third times the Reynolds number now based on l to the 1 half. So taking this, we can find a average Q. And that average Q is just going to be our capital Q dot, our total heat transfer, divided by the area of our flat plate, which is just the width multiplied by the length. 
And so from that, the Ws will cancel out and we'll end up with a K over L multiplied by delta T multiplied by the same term here. So again, everything but this delta T is going to be our heat transfer coefficient, but now we can call this an average heat transfer coefficient. So for a flat plate, we can say that our Nusselt number based on length is going to be equal to that same 0.664 times the Prandtl number to the one third times the Reynolds number to the one half. And for a flat plate, we can write the heat transfer as Q dot is equal to the Nusselt number here, multiplied by the width multiplied by K times delta T. And these are the two key results from this video. We care about the Nusselt number, and then we're going to care a lot about how to convert the Nusselt number back into the total heat transfer. We lost a lot of the detail of how we actually get to this heat flux, but it comes from a lot of the same place that the Blasius equation comes from. And so a lot of those steps end up similar, which is why we have this 0.332 term. The important thing is that it's inefficient to kind of keep this information in hand. And so we typically write it as a Nusselt number instead. And we need to be able to convert from the Nusselt number to the total heat transfer. And that's what we really care about. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it helps as you calculate heat transfer on flat plates.